Wake Up Call. blue horizons far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, sit us revel in their exotic splendor. Come with us as we head for Port of Call. Dawn over the Atlantic. Dawn gilding the indigo waters of the Gulf Stream, touching the masthead with rosy light. And as the eastern horizon brightens, dead ahead on our bow, a burnished headland is rising majestically out of the glistening sea. Our steamer plows to the balmy Caribbean toward tropical Cuba, our beckoning port of call. We are steaming now to the narrow channel of a great fourth-lined harbor with grim Moro Castle and Cabana Fortress on the heights to our left. And on our starboard bow lies the far-flung panorama of the capital of the Pearl of the Antilles, Havana. From the deck, we can see the ancient La Punta Fort, the curving sweep of the Malacan, that glorious drive skirting the ocean, while beyond stretches the expanse of flat-topped houses, pink in the early sunlight, the lofty modern buildings in the golden dome and massive bulk of the capital. Oh, it's a relief to be through the customs. Everything I have will be much. And to think we're only 90 miles from Florida... I feel as though we'd crossed the Atlantic. Hey, the place I want to see first is Sloppy Joe's. Pretty <laughs> keen automobiles, these Cubans drive. Oh, these open cars are all right till one of these tropical rainstorms cut loose. Then watch out. I've been here before. You must like Havana. Oh, everyone does. It gets you somehow. Wait till you've heard a dance on orchestra and watch them play High Life. Now that's a game for you. Modern as it is, gay, colorful Havana is truly an exotic city. A city of astonishing contrast, with the old world rubbing elbows with the new. Stroll along O'Reilly or Obispo streets, narrow, crowded, the shops shaded by bright awnings, or motor along the majestic Prado, or out along the Malacan to the fashionable Vedado district, and you will be conscious of a subtle welding of South and North America, an exciting, unforgettable admixture of Rio de Janeiro and New York, with a distinct flavor of Parisian sophistication. It was on Sunday, October 28, 1492, a few days after he had sighted the first isle of the Antilles, that Christopher Columbus saw another shoreline. And ho! Take my glass, good Sebastian. What make you of yonder land? I see a verdant shore, Excellency. I am certain it is no island. At last, Sebastian, we have reached that land which Marco Polo found. It is Sipango, near the realm of the great Kubla Khan. In truth, I believe it is, Don Columbus. A rich land, dark with forests. Fairest land men's eyes have ever gazed upon. Here shall we find spices, jades, and gold beyond our richest dreams. Your Excellency, take the glass again. Unless my eyes betray me, there are moving figures on the shore. Aye, men. They stretch out their arms to the ship. Some are kneeling in wonder. 
The sea is calm. Make ready the boats and have them manned. I go ashore to claim this land for our most gracious patrons, their majesties Ferdinand and Isabella. Christopher Columbus never realized his error. He died content in the belief that he had found the western passage to Asia. He named the country Juana in honor of Prince Juan, the son of Ferdinand. What he had really discovered was an island some 700 miles in length and called by the naked, peaceful, and friendly inhabitants, Cubancan, or Cuba. In the year 1511, Columbus' own son, Diego Columbus, ruled in Santo Domingo as governor of Hispaniola. To him he called one of his leaders, Diego Velasquez. Don Velasquez, we shall colonize this island of Juana. That duty I assign to you. You do me great honor, Excellency. It is a venture after my own heart. What have I heard of this Cuban Khan? Of great harbors, of high mountains, and the promise of great treasure in the interior. Uh, what captains would you choose to accompany you? Don Hernando de Soto, First Excellency. He is a valiant leader. And I would have a secretary, young Hernando Cortez. That firebrand? Uh, firebrand he is, Don Diego. Bold, adventuresome, hot-blooded. But he has a long head on his shoulders and fears no man. Nor husband, if gossip speaks truth. <laughs> yeah, stout Cortez has a roving eye. Eh, have him, if you will. The lad itches for conquest in New Spain. So was the Spanish colonization of Cuba begun. And its beginning was characteristic of the 400 years of misrule to follow. Four centuries of intolerable tyranny and incredibly brutish cruelty. Of outrage, enslavement, and torture so unspeakable that the population of about 250,000 had dwindled to 500 within the space of the first 50 years of Spanish occupation. One Indian chieftain, Hatagaway, dared to resist the invasion. But his little band of followers were surrounded and Hatagaway taken prisoner. His Excellency Don Diego Velasquez condemns you to death by burning Hatagaway for treason to His Majesty, the King of Spain. I am ready to die. Repent you now, heathen. Forsake the false and feeble gods of your people. And you may yet find bliss everlasting in heaven. Are there many Spaniards in those happy realms you promised me, soldier? Ah, many. The streets of heaven are filled with Spaniards. Then I will have nothing to do with your heaven. I will not go to a place where I may meet one of your accursed race. Although the Spanish conquistadores were doomed to disappointment in their fabulous dreams of gold and treasure in Cuba, the settlements flourished, and the colony proved a rich one for the mother country. But always the seeds of uprising and rebellion were sprouting, to be kept down only by the harshest measures. The Creoles, or white Cubans, were robbed, tortured, and treated with the most contemptuous cruelty by the captain's general. It was in the latter half of the 19th century that Cuban insurgency became a nationalistic issue. Its leaders the fervent, excitable youth of Havana and Santiago, the young men of old aristocratic families. It is the year 1871, and Carlos Aguera and his sister Carmita are dining at the Café Dominica. Look, Carmita, there is Cisneros entering. He has seen us, Carlos. He is coming this way. I shall not put up with his insults, this pig of a Spaniard. No, no, Carlos. Do not quarrel with him. You must not risk offending him. Senorita Aguera, may I sit with you? We are honored, Don Cisneros. You know my brother, Carlos? <laughs> a student, I am told. Don Carlos, a free political thinker. 
Such things are best left to older heads. My ancestors were Spanish, but I am a Cuban. There are no Cubans. Only true patriots of Spain or enemies. Ah, but why should we talk of politics when the senorita's eyes are like dark stars? You should not waste such charm, such beauty in these outlands. Perhaps we shall see you at Madrid or Barcelona. Havana is my home. I remain here always. Uh, we shall see. We Spaniards have a way of getting what we set our hearts to. I cannot permit such talk, Don Cisneros. Huh? My sister is in my care. Come, Carmita. It's time we were leaving. And why should I not serve as caballero to the senorita? No. I thank you, Captain Cisneros. But my brother will escort me. When is not yet. I look to see you soon, senorita Carmita. Perhaps then we may speak again of Barcelona. <laughs> And the next night at the Aguera home in the old Cerro district of Havana. It will not be long before the youth of Cuba arises. But we must be careful, Carlos. I am ready when you rest, Yes, I, I am ready too. The flight of the Cubans is intolerable. I have implored my sister here to join our father in exile. Last night, Cisneros forced his company upon us again, and we were dining at the Café Dominica. It was only Carmita's presence and the danger to her that kept me from hurling my wine in his face. Oh, he would have killed you instantly, Carlos. It is for you I fear, my brother, not myself. I saw three officers of the accursed volunteers watching you in the park yesterday, Carlos. Have a care. Cisneros was one of them. All students are under su suspicion since the defacement of the graves of the Spanish soldiers. It is a false charge. That was not the work of our friends. You know it well. Please. Yet eight of them await trial. God knows what indignities they now suffer in the dungeons of the Moros. Let's see. And little chance they have for fair trial. There can be no justice for Cubans while the volunteers control the city. There is no evidence against the eight. The Capitan General must free them all. But the volunteers are incensed. They demand blood. Tonight, the Prado is swarming with Spaniards. I saw them gathering in the Plaza de Arms as I come here. Ah, too well, I know these volunteers. Was I not in the theater that night we sang the Cuban songs? Did I not see them ruthlessly pour their volley into us unarmed? The man at my left was shot through the arm. His blood spattered me. Come. Come here to the window, Carlo. Something is happening at the Plaza. Morris, what brings you here all out of breath? Why are you so white? Oh, beasts, the swine, they are executing our friends. What? The eighth. See, I dare not remain on the street. The Spaniards have gone oh, mad. No, no, not the you you. It's a lynch law trial. All enemies of Cuba, all volunteers. A travesty of justice. They gathered at the plaza by thousands. I saw our friends led before the judges and convicted. Oh, I could not remain to see the end. I hastened here. You hear? It is the firing squad. My friends are with the patriots of Cuba, in heaven, with General Agramonte and the others. Peace to their souls. Cuba libre! We shall not Cuba, libre. Cuba libre! Cuba libre! Cuba libre! Nor were these martyrs to Cuban liberty forgotten. The torch of freedom they and their comrades lighted was finally carried on to glorious victory with the help of another country conceived in liberty. <laughs> It is 2 o'clock in the morning, February 16th, 1898, when John D. Long, Secretary of the Navy of the United States, is awakened at his home in Washington. A telegram just arrived for you, sir. Well, was it really necessary to awaken me at this hour? Well, the message is from the State Department, sir, to be delivered only into your hands. Oh, well, give it here. Yeah, it's from Cuba. Hmm. Must be from Captain Sigsby. Hey, Joe, listen to this. It is from Sigsby. Battleship Maine, blown up in Havana Harbor at 9.40 tonight and destroyed. Many wounded and doubtless more killed or burned. Public opinion should be suspended until further reports. All officers believed to be saved. 
Many Spanish officers, including representatives of General Blanco, now with me, express sympathy. Sigsby. The main? Mm. The main sunk in a Spanish harbor? Blown up? Oh, what does this mean? It probably means war. The public is ripe for a war with Spain. They want to liberate the starving Cubans. It's extremely grave. Well, that'll be the reporters, Mr. Long. Wait till those boys get at their typewriters. I'm afraid poor Sigsby's admonition to withhold judgment won't count for much. Uh, who is it, Gates? Gentlemen of the press, sir. Oh. Tell them my secretary will talk to them. And I shall have a statement for the papers later. You see them, John. Yes, sir. Don't commit us or express any opinion. No, sir. I must telephone Mr. McKinley. Uh, get the White House on the line, Gates, in my office. Say it's urgent. I must speak to the president. So, oh. oh, uh, come in, gentlemen. Come in. Oh. Well... Here we are. You, you're almost ahead of our news. What about the main? Please, please, gentlemen. Uh, we only got the message ourselves a few minutes ago. We uh, we must consider the situation. Oh, this is war, man. War. war. Forget the main in a hurry. Battleship main, son of a man. President McKinley's declaration of war against Spain aroused a great wave of extravagant enthusiasm and patriotism throughout the nation. This was a popular war, and the president's call for volunteers, issued on the 23rd of April, 1898, was answered by most of the young men of the best families, eager to fight for the cause of the Cubans. The press sent its most brilliant correspondence down to Florida, where they waited impatiently in the heat for hostilities to commence. Someone named this a newspaper war, and not without justification, for it proved a tremendous stimulant for lagging circulation. On the 1st of May, Admiral Dewey captured or destroyed all the ships the Spanish fleet stationed at Manila. Meanwhile, Spain had dispatched another fleet to Cuban waters under the command of Admiral Severa. An American flotilla headed by Admiral Sampson set out from Key West, pursued by a persistent press boat to find the Spaniards and do battle. After a rather ludicrous game of hide-and-seek, the Spanish ships were finally located, bottled up in the harbor of Santiago de Cuba. Here they lurked in exasperating safety their guns protecting the city, while the American fleet lay outside, unable to get at their adversaries. Finally, a bold stroke was decided upon. Admiral Sampson, on the night of June the 1st, called to his quarters a young naval constructor, Lieutenant Richmond P. Hobson. Mr. Hobson, I've decided to execute the plan which you and I discussed. You mean submerge the collier Merrimack in the harbor entrance? I do. The channel is but a hundred yards in width. If we can sink the Merrimack broadside at this point on the chart... Severa's ships must stay inside until the entrance is cleared. And that won't be until they surrender. And you'll put me in charge of this venture, sir? That is for you to choose. I can't conscientiously order any officer to submit to so perilous an undertaking. It's not likely that those who attempt this will ever return. But I ask for it, sir. I volunteer for this duty. And I don't believe that escape is impossible. I've been studying the whole matter for the past few days, and I believe we can bring it off, sir. Shall I choose the men who are to accompany me? We must first ask for volunteers. How many shall you need? Six or seven, sir. My plan is this. We shall run the Merrimack within a hundred yards of the Moro's guns, swing around, drop anchors at stern and bow, open the sea valves, and explode our torpedoes. We shall need two men for the engine and boiler rooms, one at each anchor, one at the wheel, and one to help with the torpedoes. And after she's sunk, what of you and your men? We shall set free on a raft and a catamaran, and when the torpedoes are exploded, swim to one or the other. Very good, Mr. Hobson. Pass the word for volunteers and signal the other ships. Aye, sir. Right away. Hundreds of officers and men at once proffered their services and clamored to make the sacrifice, which seemed to spell certain death. Seven were selected by Lieutenant Hobson. On the night of June 2nd, the attempt was made. When the Merrimack was within 500 yards of the fortress, creeping slowly with all lights extinguished, the alarm was sounded and firing from the heavy shore, batteries commenced to be taken up by the troops while mines were exploded in the entrance and in the waters and torpedoes discharged at the doomed vessel. It is the morning following, and Samson is pacing the deck of his flagship, the New York, hoping for news. In the gray dawn, a tug flying a flag of truce put out from shore and approached the New York. It held several Spanish officers who were invited to come aboard. Admiral Sampson, I am Capitan Bustamante. Admiral Severa's chief of staff. We bring you word of your courageous men. 
They are safe. Thank God for that. Lieutenant Hobson and his men are our honored prisoners. The Admiral himself took Lieutenant Hobson aboard his launch from the raft, where all eight men concealed themselves throughout the night. They suffered greatly from exposure in the cold water, but they are all well now and being properly cared for. We salute their bravery, but their venture has failed. Yes? How? It is no secret, Admiral Sampson. The Merrimack's rudder was shot away by our fire. Daring as Lieutenant Hobson was, in the face of our fire, he could not possibly maneuver his ship to a position so that it would effectively block the entrance of Santiago Harbor. Hmm. I, I, I would not have believed your gunnery so accurate. Your country and your navy may well be proud of your men. Admiral Severa wishes me to inform you that he is willing to exchange them under the rules and courtesies of war. Your admiral is a generous foe as well as a great leader. Please present my thanks and compliments. <laughs> Just one month to a day after Hobson's exploit, Severa sallied forth from Santiago Harbor in a brave and desperate attempt to save his men of war. As the great ships emerged one by one, guns roaring, the American ships attacked in a brief but terrific battle. The proud ships of Spain went down, each a blazing inferno, or were beached on the rocky Cuban coast. And all the while, the presses of American newspapers ground out their blazing headlines. Severa's fleet sunk. Thompson, hero of Santiago. Cuba must be freed. Support the starving Cubans. Rough riders reach Cuba. Santiago is falling. Liberty for Cuba. Cuba libre. Santiago was attacked from the land by American troops under the command of General Shafter. The Spanish had entrenched at San Juan Hill, and at daybreak, the Americans began their assault on these positions. Two brigades under General Samuel S. Sumner and Colonel Leonard Wood, assisted by Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, were deployed at the base of the hills. Let us join Richard Harding Davis, most famous of newspaper correspondents, who has been invited to participate in the deliberations preparatory to the assault. General Wheeler, there can be but one course to follow. We must charge the hillside immediately and drive them from their entrenchments on the crest. You realize, Colonel Roosevelt, what that means? There are sharpshooters on the heights. They have effective cover, while our men must expose themselves almost every yard of the way. Mr. Davis, you've seen more fighting than most of us. Do you think we can drive these Spaniards out? Well, in my opinion, General Wheeler, Colonel Roosevelt is right. Absolutely. Delay will not help matters. The time to attack is now. Grimes and Captain Capron's batteries, hampered by lack of smokeless powder and offering a perfect target to our adversaries, cannot hope to shell those positions successfully. This whole war has been characterized by shilly-shallying, by delays and mistakes. Action is what we need now. Uh, I wish I were in Washington before Congress for a few minutes. I'd tell them something about the way this war is being managed. Shoddy clothes, unfit food, insufficient supplies. A commanding general who's too ill to be at the front yet who insists on issuing orders. Well, pardon me, gentlemen. That is some general safety for you, sir. Oh. Chafee has commenced his attack upon El Kamei. He expects us to take San Juan Hill. Then there's no reason for further delay. We must charge the hills and drive them from their positions. Colonel Wood's men are already deployed. Mine await my orders. We must not fail Lawton's troops and Chafee. If you will let me, I'll lead the way with my rough riders. I shall order them to dismount and go forward on foot. It'll be guerrilla warfare. The very kind these Spaniards know best. Every knoll, every bush conceals a mouser. Now our Westerners will never stop until they're victorious. They know open country fighting. They're not afraid of gunfire. Very good, Colonel Roosevelt. You may give your men the order to advance. Delighted. Mr. Davis, I must ask you not to expose yourself needlessly. Your editor would not thank me if we did not return you safe and sound. Thanks for your consideration, General. Don't worry about me. I can look after myself. Rough Riders! Tension! Forward! San Juan fell before the Rough Riders, led by Colonel Roosevelt. El Camay fell. Shortly, Santiago capitulated, and General Blanco withdrew his troops from Cuba and sailed for Spain. The brief Spanish-American war was over. A newspaper war indeed, marked by a woeful lack of strategy and taking needless toll of many lives. After four centuries, Cuba was free at last.
modern Cuba is yet deservedly a most popular playground for travelers. The charm of his ancient cities, Santiago, oriental in color and background, Matanzas and the nearby Yamuri Valley, and wonderful caves of Belamar, Cienfuegos, Cardenas, and others cast an unforgettable spell over the visitor. But it is always Havana which exercises the most potent charm. Its restaurants, many of them sidewalk cafes in a continental manner, invite our leisure for refrescos, those harmless, brightly tinted iced syrups of fresh fruits, dear to the heart of all Cubans. Our palates are tempted by new dishes in endless and irresistible variety. Sopa de quarta hora, a chowder of fish, moro crabs more appetizing than lobster, patinos, fritos, or fried plantains, tortillas, and pisto manchego. For our entertainment, we can visit the President's Palace, the Capitol, the main monument on the Malacan, El Moro, La Fuerza, facing the Plaza de Armas, El Templete, the cathedral which once contained the venerated bones of Christopher Columbus. By day, there is the great playa, or beach, the racetrack, a splendid country club, two yacht clubs, and many fascinating drives into the surrounding country. By night, there are the high eye games, played by professionals in the great Fontone, the casino, a Monte Carlo in miniature, theaters, dance songs, and smart nightclubs. And now our ship is sailing, and we bid a reluctant adieu to all this old world glamour, this new world brightness and activity. Farewell, Havana. Farewell, Cuba. May we visit your bright shores soon again. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.